Pestum, Italy, D-Day, September 9th, 1943, 0530. All along the American landing zones, from Red Beach to Blue Beach, things are going to hell for the 36th Infantry Division. At Yellow Beach, a medieval tower, like something out of a fairy tale, is spraying machine gun fire. At Blue Beach, German tanks have counterattacked and forced their way onto the sand. And at Green and Red Beaches, riflemen are trying to push forward against German machine gunners hidden in the ancient Greek ruins above, with the Americans' return fire simply chewing marble pillars. Artillery from the hills around Salerno hammers the troops. A landing craft burns. Soldiers keep arriving in the wrong place, so rifle companies are engaging the medieval tower and tanks without their supporting artillery. The Salerno landings will not be the easy victory the Allies had predicted. In fact, this D-Day will come dangerously close to failure. This extra extra history once again was made possible by the folks over at Company of Heroes 3 and their epic new entry into the COH franchise that not only is just a ton of fun, but also directly ties into this week's historical tale. Available right now at the link below. Amphibious landings are always complicated, bloody affairs, but the attacker does have one chief advantage, the element of surprise, as defenders cannot be certain where an attacker will choose to land or when. Though at Salerno, the Allies had no such luxury. Salerno itself was a logical landing ground, German planes spotted the Allied fleet assembling, and even local fishermen in Sicily knew the target. And, though German forces had only arrived the day before to disarm the surrendering Italians, who had learned via an Allied radio announcement that their country had pulled out of the war, they came in force, supported by tanks and aircraft, with artillery pieces ringing the hills above the landing zones. But, to be clear, these were not just any German soldiers, they were veterans, including some who'd become masters of urban warfare in the rat warrens of Stalingrad. The attacking Allies, by contrast, were raw. The bulk of the American force was the 36th Infantry Division, an untested Texas National Guard unit. And many British regiments came from the Territorial Army, their equivalent of the National Guard, and they had not yet experienced heavy fighting. Not to mention even veteran British units were also filled with fresh replacements, leaving only the American Rangers and British Commandos who climbed aboard their transports with solid combat records. And that difference showed on D-Day. In the British sector, units landed at 0330, just behind a massive rocket bombardment, but they encountered heavy resistance from a network of bunkers placed just behind the beach, guarded by minefields and razor wire. The chaos of the pre-dawn landings meant the men were ill-equipped for the problem. Engineer sections that were supposed to clear mines got scattered to the wrong beaches, units intermixed, and support weapons meant to deal with tanks and bunkers wound up in the wrong place. It wasn't until 0700 that the British managed to overwhelm and silence the strong points and move inland. On the American beaches, things were only slightly better. There, commanders had hoped to preserve the element of surprise by landing troops without a preliminary naval bombardment or bombing. As a result, though, the German defenses were completely operable. Above, German aircraft engines roared through the sky, picking targets of opportunity. While Allied aircraft were flying missions from the light carriers in the invasion fleet, that was mostly to protect the ships. Meanwhile, the larger Allied air contingent was flying in from Sicily at the edge of their effective range, meaning that they'd expended so much fuel arriving that they could only fight for a few minutes before having to turn around. Meanwhile, German fighters and bombers struck from airfields only 10 minutes from the Allies' struggling bridgeheads. But, as field guns and tanks landed on the beach, the Texans managed to push back against the German counterattacks and start securing objectives. By afternoon, they'd cleared the ancient ruins at Pestum and set up a command post amidst the columns. Soldiers working modern radio sets where hoplites once walked. Wanting to cut German air superiority, a group of Sherman tanks and tank destroyers zipped ahead of the main line to seize the airfield north of Pestum. They crashed through the fence unopposed, and for a few moments just rampaged through the refueling and taxiing German craft, destroying nearly 40 before panzers beat them back to the far end of the runway. Likewise, the landing of the British commandos and rangers had gone well, encountering only light resistance, and they'd seized crucial roads and passes in the north of the combat zone. And as dusk closed in on D-Day, the generals took stock. Okay, things had not gone as planned. Most inland objectives remained in enemy hands, and the British bridgehead was extremely narrow and insecure. Not to mention casualties had been heavy, but all that said, it wasn't a total disaster, though it soon became one. Because the German plan was never to deny the Allies the landing beaches. Rather, it was to slow them down, maul them in a series of counterattacks, and allow reinforcements to concentrate enough power to push them off the beach. 
and they were extremely good at that. Over the next week, Allied forces paid for each objective in blood. In their area, the British would assault an industrial complex multiple times to no avail. The whole area around the River Tushano became a grinding back-and-forth slaughter, and British commanders would throw their troops at a series of hills nicknamed for their features Hospital Hill, White House Hill, Commando Hill, etc. again and again, taking them, losing them, and retaking them. But that was the German strategy. Combined arms assaults with tanks, infantry, and artillery to take a high point, defend it while using it to call down said artillery, booby trap it, then pull back and do it again. Force the Allies to take the same ground over and over. That pattern played out in the American sector as well, especially around an old tobacco factory that formed a ready-made fortress threatening the bridgehead. Repeatedly, American and German troops would sweep into the smashed brick walls of the building, laying in the rubble and flanking around its outskirts. It actually changed hands five times during the battle. Then, around the Renaissance town of Alta Vila, surrounded by hills and ridges, a horrifying drama played out. As American units pushed forward to capture the town, German veterans exploited gaps in their lines, infiltrating behind the Americans to surround and capture them. A situation that got so bad that a single German battalion defeated four American ones. And that was when the Germans saw their opportunity. If they could retake the tobacco factory and the bridges nearby, then push with armor and seize the pontoon bridges American engineers had built across a river near the beach, they could encircle and destroy the U.S. 45th Infantry Division. September 13th, Black Monday. The attack hits the American line like a storm. Mechanized infantry pins units in place so they can't stop the main attack. Panzers slam into the American Shermans and take the tobacco factory and its bridges. One American battalion, General Clark's last reserve unit, just committed that morning, is encircled and destroyed. Over 500 men die or are taken captive in 30 minutes. And the Panzers scream on, headed directly toward the two pontoon bridges, which, if taken, will make the Salerno landings fail. There are no American troops left to commit. On the beach, officers shove rifles into the hands of engineers and logistics troops and tell them to head to the river. They drag every piece of artillery that they can find there, along with tank destroyers and anti-aircraft guns, cranked down to fire like cannons. This impromptu artillery battery unleashes hell on the incoming tank column. Crews fire up to eight shells per minute, hot brass casings piling up around their feet. In the field beyond, a tank burns, another explodes, then a detonation in the American line. Engineers have blown the pontoon bridges. Now no matter what, the Germans will not have them they stop the advance. That night, Clark relieves several officers of command, looking for scapegoats, because no one knows that the turning point has come. That evening, units of the 82nd Airborne parachute down onto the beach as reinforcements, steadying the American lines. Montgomery, whose failed diversionary attack is advancing northward, is now within days of arriving in Salerno, and more British and American reinforcements will arrive soon after. Then, on the night of September 17th, German forces withdraw in good order, ready to repeat these tactics, and bleed the Allies all the way to Rome. Operation Avalanche was an Allied victory. Eisenhower and Churchill had their foothold on mainland Europe, and a solid first step toward liberating Italy. But the cost had been a steep one. The Allies suffered 12,560 men killed, wounded, captured, or missing, to a mere 4,000 on the German side. Though, in a way, it would prove to be expensive for the Germans as well. Because though the Salerno landings were a debacle, it was a debacle the Allies could learn from. The key takeaway was the importance of naval firepower, which often proved the decisive factor in driving back German counter-assaults in the seesaw combats around Salerno. But there were also lessons about how to organize a beachhead, the importance of air supremacy, and to guard gaps in the line with overwhelming firepower. All lessons which would pay dividends in 1944 at a different D-Day in Normandy. And if you're in the mood for even more stories from World War II, but perhaps in a more, I don't know, interactive medium, then you've definitely got to check out the brand new Company of Heroes 3, who made this extra extra history series possible. Seriously, this game has all of its bases covered, letting you really play your own way. I mean, for starters, it has not only one, but two different styles of single player experience you can do. First up, you got your North African operation, which is a really gripping linear experience where you relive some of the most famous battles of the theater, such as Tobruk, El Alamein, and more. 
more. And on the flip side, you have the Italian Dynamic Campaign, which is a full sandbox-style gameplay experience with an ever-changing campaign map that allows you to command the overall war effort in Italy while also experiencing an unprecedented level of strategic choice in a world and story that actually reacts to your decisions. Oh, and it's also the biggest COH single-player experience to date, by the way. This game is just massive. Then if you want to dip your toe into the multiplayer realm, there are just so many more options. You can play with up to four friends in versus AI co-op, or engage in just blistering PvP combat modes in all flavors from 1v1 to 4v4, and all of them with new mechanics, new factions, and just more units than ever before. And we haven't even talked about all of the other new goodies yet. Stuff like beautiful high-res environments you get to play in, everything from sleepy fishing villages and rolling mountains, to sweeping deserts and oasises. Oasi? Oases. Wait, what's the plural of oasis? Doesn't matter. Also, there's deep perfaction tech trees that unlock new game mechanics and just really cool, authentic layered storytelling that helps deliver more diverse points of view on the conflict than ever before. Also, on a bit of a personal note, because I sometimes get a little overwhelmed while playing RTSs, I'm really excited about a feature they're calling Full Tactical Pausing. That'll basically allow me to engage with their single-player content at my own pace, and I just think that's a wonderful accessibility option that's going to help me and a ton of other people out enjoying this thing. Really great move on the team there. So if all of that sounds up your alley, Company of Heroes 3 is available as of right now, and you can snag a copy for yourself by visiting the link in the description below. What if I told you that Ahmed Ziad Turk, Angela Valenciana, Arcolite Games, Casey Mustia, Dominic Valenciana, Joseph Blame, Kuya Koi, and Skylar Holmes were all legendary patrons? I'm not kidding. 